church. Uh, we have been going through the book of Luke now for over a year. We actually started December last year going through the book of Luke. And, and during COVID, we had a couple of different um, changes in that series. And um, we looked at Revelations for a little bit there and then an Ask It series, just relating to COVID and just having a, a better understanding of that. And, um, but we're back to Luke now, and I've really enjoyed the book of Luke. And the reason for that is because we're looking, really, the whole series, the idea of the series is to look at the works, the ways, and the words of Jesus. What, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the idea of going through the book of Luke is if we believe that Jesus is our example, if we believe that Jesus didn't just come to earth to die for us, but he also came to earth so that we could learn how to live our life, then we actually have to stop as a church and look at not just what he did or how he did it, but also what he says. And so as a church, we've been journeying through this. And today, we're going to be looking at living in the light. Today, we're going to be looking at this scripture that he starts off by by kind of saying a duh, obvious statement. But the depth behind his statement is profound. It is so important that we are reminded of this. And the first thing I want to say, if you're visiting with us today and you're thinking, here we go, church doing a series for their congregation. Actually, today what I want to say to you is this is you you personally. If we want to talk about being the light if we want to talk about shining a light, the moment we turn it into an organizational church body, it's all of us, we as a church need to be lied into the community. We are actually, we are actually kind of palming off responsibility because actually when he's talking here, he's not just talking, hey, corporately, and when I say corporate, I know some people don't like the word corporate, but what I mean by the word corporate is uh, a big group of people, okay? When we talk about it as a big group of people, all of a sudden it's very easy to palm it off and say, yeah, but if the leaders do, and if the leaders do that, and what about those people do? But really this scripture, and what I want to think you to think about today is this scripture is directly speaking to you now. If you have asked Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, we will see that you've been given a light. You've been given a light. So don't fob it off. So today, if you're visiting or you call us home, I want you to think about this as an individual message to you directly. As I was uh, preparing for this message, I, I read the first line of uh, Luke 8, 16, and, and it kind of hits you with this scripture that you're like, uh, hello. And so it, it's kind of like, the illogical thing. It states an illogical thing to do. And, and as I was thinking about illogical things we do, I started to think about actually what illogical things I may do or people I know may do. So I've written some down. If you don't agree or have never seen these, you will just realize how different I am. But um, hopefully it will make sense to you. Uh, the first one that is one of my uh, cardinal sins, I think, I do it all the time, is continual, continually Check the fridge to see if any food has magically appeared. Right? I'm bored. I'm bored eating. So I walk up to the fridge, open the fridge, and I say, hey, mm, nothing. Walk away. I'm bored again. Walk back. Mm, nothing. I like to call it faith. I like to think that if Jesus provided for the 5,000, one day I will open the fridge and ta-ta. Now, that's my... Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah, it's a good theory. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to go. Um, I think my belly isn't the important one in this world. Um, another one. My mum is a shocker for this one. This may be related to you. After making a typing mistake, you delete the entire sentence and start over instead of just simply backspacing and fixing the word. My mum does it all the time. I watch her and I'm like, it just makes no sense, right? It's just an illogical thing that we do. What about this for the dog lovers? I'm guilty of this. I'm sorry, to, I'll say that before. Pretend like dogs are mini horses and try to ride them. Come on, people do that. I know there's people in here. 
Doesn't make sense. For the cat lovers, meow back at cats. Yep, all the time, doesn't it? Uh, so uh, t- uh, yesterday morning we had, our yard was full of cockatoos, and so me and my three girls were sitting on the back deck, uh, and we were, we were squawking at birds. Go figure. Um, what about this one for the young ones who like their music? Um, put your music on shuffle only to skip all the songs until you find the one you want. Um, and then for those who don't know, I love lawns. I'm a little bit of a lawn fanatic and uh, I like fertilising, mowing, all that. And um, this one makes no sense to most of you and it's to fertilise your lawn just to have to mow it more often. I say yes, most of you say, what the? Um, And then this one. This one is probably the one I personally find the funniest, okay? Because I can just imagine if if my mobile device was a human. So um, people grab their tablet or their phone or their computer and they click it and it just doesn't respond as quick as you want, right? So instead of just waiting, it's like... (laughs) Right? You can imagine if your device was a human. You're like, hey, can you go and get those papers for me? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll get there. (laughs) Papers everywhere, and you're pushing and you're prodding. My advice to you, stop, press it once, five seconds later, press it again, it should be okay. Okay, there's some illogical things we do. Hopefully you found them somewhat amusing to start the day, but also they, they're illog- they, they make no sense, right? But we do them because it's just what we've always done, or, or we do it without thinking. And here, Luke begins, uh, not Luke, Jesus begins by teaching his disciples. Now, I want to paint a picture. This is not necessarily exactly how it was, but this is how my brain is thinking. Uh, Jesus is sitting around with his disciples, And he's under a tree, and he's there teaching his disciples. See, if we look at the ways of Jesus and how Jesus did it, he comes around, and he he spends all this time with a few, with a group of disciples. Because Jesus knew that if he went out and tried to just impact the whole world, that he was one man. He was God, but in in body, and he was only able to do so much. So instead, he invests into 12 disciples heavily. And so there's Jesus teaching his disciples, and by now, there's all these people that are interested in what Jesus is saying. And so what happens is there's all these people gathered around listening to what they're saying, but Jesus is specifically here talking, discipling, teaching his disciples at this time. And in Luke 8, 16 on to 18, it says this, No one lights a lamp, then covers it up with a bowl or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light can be seen by all who enter the house. For all that is secret will eventually be brought out into the open, and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. So pay attention to how you hear To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. And these three verses, if you could break each verse up into what it is, what I would like to suggest is verse verse 16 is saying the example. So it's giving this key example. It's saying, pay attention, guys. You wouldn't do this, right? And then in verses uh, 17, it's a reminder. Remember, God knows everything. Remember, everything you do in private or in public, God knows it all. And then verse 18, and and we're going to read 19 to 21 soon, but verse 18 and those verses are more of a warning. They're a warning saying there's consequences. Be careful. And so let's break down what the actual example that Jesus is using. And as I did this and I started to read different uh, interpretations and I started to read different commentaries and look at the Greek and and look at all the different uh, sides of of what was written, I realized just that the depth of the scripture was more than just, oh yeah, I need to shine my light. 
When we break this down and we start to look at it, there's a lot more to this. Remember what I said at the start. This is not talking corporate. This is you right now. This is directly at you right now. And so verse 16, uh, the first five words of the uh, verse say, no one lights a lamp and then covers it up with a bowl or hides it under a bed. No one covers a lamp. And so just to bring some, to help us understand, okay, what is he exactly saying? The first couple of things I want to answer is who lights the lamp? Well, we see over and over and again through Scripture that when we ask Jesus into our life, when God gives us Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, a light is lit within us. So we can say that God the Father lights the light, lights the light in all of us. Who, who is the lamp? Well, the lamp is you and I. We are the vessels. And then, who is the light? Is Jesus. When we ask Jesus into our life as our Lord and Savior, Jesus comes and dwells within us. So there we see the, the vessel, the lamp itself is us, our body, who we are. The light is Jesus in us. And the Father is the one who has given it, given it to us. In John uh, eight twelve, it says, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Jesus is the light. I had a friend of mine who owned a T-shirt, and, and it's always stuck with me, this T-shirt. It was about 15 years ago. And um, every time he wore it, I'd just kind of look at it and have a giggle to myself. But it was so true. And the exact thing that it said was, and it had a big moon on it. It said, be the moon, reflect the sun. See, we can't, we cannot be Jesus. We know this. Jesus, there's only one Jesus. But when we ask Jesus into our life, he's in us and we have the opportunity to be more like Jesus and to reflect and shine the light into to the community. When I talk about shining the light, what I want to say, I, I tend to use the words more of circle of influence. And I want to talk about that very soon because what we tend to do is when we think about, hey, we need to shine the light, we always talk to change, our to change our community or to change Australia or to change the world. And, and it just becomes too big. And we're going to look at that in a moment. And so now we know what the lamp is, we know what the light is, and we know who lights the light. Now I want to look at what the actual meaning behind the bowl and the bed is. So we're going back to verse 16 of Luke 8. And it says, No one lights a lamp and then covers it with a bowl, or hides it under a bed. A lamp is placed on a stand where it, its light can be seen by all who enter the house. Now, the first one that I want to just quickly mention is the bowl. The Greek word here that is used is actually plant. And the word plant actually means a unit or measurement used for trade. It was actually a vessel, a, a, a a bowl that was exactly a certain amount of, of liquid could take. So, for example, uh, you imagine if you went down to Woolies and you took your plant, your bowl, and, and it was exactly one litre, and when you went to buy it, you knew that you would fill that up, and that would give you exactly one litre, and then you'd take it to the checkout, pay for it. It's that same. It's a measurement that is used for business. And as you break this down, you start to see that Jesus is talking about two separate things. He's first saying to them, do not or would you hide your light in your place of business? Would you cover your light when you are working, when you're at school, when you're at university, when you're putting, expelling energy? Are you going to hide your light? And then it changes it and moves over to under the bed, and he's referring to your rest, right? It leaves no error for, or place for not shining your light. 
He's saying at work when you're busy, are you shining your light? Of course you need to be shining your light. And then on the other hand, he's saying that when you're at home, are you shining your light? Think about at work, right? Think about the opportunity God has placed. So let's talk about circle of influence, right? God has put key people in your life day to day, every day. And and we're worried about thinking about, well, we need to change our community. Imagine if each one of us went and we shone our light in our community, in our circle of influence, in those that God has put around us. But instead, sometimes people don't even know that we're Christians. Or they think, oh, he's not really different as a Christian in our place of work. It's like we, we, we're at home and we're all spiritual and, you know, we want to teach our kids about Jesus and, and, and you know, lead our wife or our husband and, and we want to do all of this. And at home, we just shine in the light. But the moment that we go to work, we just put a little bowl over it, right? Vice versa, how many times... Have you seen someone who is all about at work? I love Jesus. Look at me. Look at me. But when you go home, they're like under the bed. And Jesus is just using a simple example. A simple example that is relevant to them then and there. Saying at work at play, at relaxation, wherever you are. Of course, you're going to shine the light of the most amazing thing you've been given, which is the gift of Jesus. Then into verse 17, he gives them a warning. He says, for all that is secret will eventually be brought out into the open and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. You and I know that God sees everything. Like we think that we can just put our light under our bed or at work we can put our light over our bowl. At work we can put our light over our bowl. We think all of this, right? But at the end of the day, we know we're not fooling anyone. We know that God is there. He's saying, I see this. But see, because no one else sees it, we're okay to go about it. But what he's warning them here is, hey, 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 it is going to come out at one stage or another, this life or the next. In Hebrews 4.13, it says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. And he is the one to whom we are accountable. You and I with what we do, with how we shine our light. We are accountable. You, individually, don't pass the buck. You. To go a little bit deeper, and this really starts to to change the picture, right? In 1 Corinthians 3, he goes from, from just talking about, okay, God knows. But then he starts talking about the throne, where we have to stand as believers. And sometimes we treat heaven like it's going to be this place where you just rock up and party time and we're just going to worship God and we're saved from, from uh, hell and it's just all good, right? But the fact is, you and I will have to stand before the throne and give account for everything we've done. So let me read 1 Corinthians 3. 3 verses 13 to 15. But on the judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if the person's work has any value. If the, worker, if the work survives, the builder will receive a reward. But if the work is burnt up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved. But like someone barely escaping through the walls of the flames. So what I'm not talking about here is loss of salvation. I'm not saying to you right now that if you've asked Jesus into your life that, and you don't do the right things, that, that all of a sudden you, you've lost your salvation. What I'm saying is that when you stand before the throne, 
You have to give account. And the last thing you want to do is scrape in by the hairs of your chinny chin chin. And as I think about this, I think of um, the story of the talents, right? The master gives to, to each of his three servants, and one puts it away and does nothing with it. Does nothing. The next one gets a little, and he, and he does some stuff, and, and, and he doubles it, and he hears these beautiful words from his master. And, and then the fifth, the third, does the same, and he, and he makes more money again with what he's been given. And so, imagine. We know we've all got to stand before the throne. We know that we've got to give account for what we do. I, I couldn't give less. I, I say this respectfully with the size of church we are. Like, if we're a church of 1,000, 200, 500, that's, that's all well and good. But that's not what it's about. If we've got the best worship or the worst worship or we've got, it doesn't matter. I want you to think about it this way. You imagine each one of us lining up behind each other, coming to the throne to give account, to bring what we've done for him and put it before the throne. Imagine that. If, if, if you're a, a visual person, shut your eyes and imagine that picture. And then I want to read these verses. You imagine if one by one we heard these words. And this is the, the master talking to his servants. And this is what I believe we will hear. Or what I, my prayer is that we will hear. It says in Matthew 25, verse 21, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in hand, handling this small amount. So now I will give you much more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. You, you imagine that? One by one. You can imagine the other side of it, right? Everyone's just walking through, high-fiving each other, going, let's celebrate. But instead, sometimes I feel like we're just happy just to scrape through. We're just happy to palm on responsibility to someone else. Someone else did this to me. That church didn't satisfy what I wanted, how I wanted. That church wasn't cool enough. That church wasn't big enough. That church wasn't growing how I think growing should be. And we're happy to palm, on responsi palm off responsibility. But the fact is that what are you going to hear when you stand before the throne? And my prayer is that each one of you here right now will hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let's celebrate. And then comes the warning in verse 18. And it says, Pay attention to how you hear. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what they think they understand will be taken away from them. You think, and we talk often about athletes, right? Um, an athlete to be the best of what he needs to do he needs to exercise. He needs to exercise at the right time in the right way. And in the same way, we need to exercise our spirit. We've been given the word of God. We've been given places. We've been given people around us. And we are called to do something about that. And like an athlete, as we don't do it, as we disobey, we distance ourselves more and more. We become lazier and lazier. Like I said before, I love grass. And I was talking to a group of young adults a couple of months ago. And we were talking about healthy stress. And that, they were talking about being stressed. And I said, actually, no one grows to be their full potential without stress. It's, it's healthy stress. It's good stress. There's no athlete that sits on their but all day and hopes the fridge refills itself, um, right? There's no athlete that does well when they need to exercise. 
They don't, don't become effective of what they do. And so I was talking to them about grass, and I gave them this example. The, the way the conversation started is they say, Leighton, why do you mow so often? And I said, the reason why I mow so often is because I don't want to put the grass through too much stress, but I just want to put it through enough. And they said, but if you mow too much, aren't you putting it through extra stress? And so here's some lawn tips with Leighton today. If you allow your grass to grow really long, what your grass is actually doing is it's saying, I'm satisfied. It's putting up this big, thick leaf, right? And it's taking all the energy from the sun. It's taking, obviously it needs water, but we're thinking sun perspective at the moment. Um, the sun. So this leaf, as humans... As everything in the world, we take the path of least resistance. If you're, I'm an auto electrician by trade, that's what I'm trained in. If you're a plumber, you'll know this very well. In everything in life, it takes the path of least resistance. Electricity does it, plumbing does it, we do it. When the easy way out is there, we will take it, unless we are prepared to put ourselves to stress. Right? And so the grass says, this is easy. Put up one shoot of grass, Look how thick and nice and green I am. I can get all the sun I need. Great. But then you come along and mow it down to the bottom, and then it's got no leaf to show, and it ends up looking straggly and ugly, and, and so you're going, like, hitting it. The rule with grass is the healthy stress to put grass under is a two-third rule. So it means that you never take more than one... Sorry, one-third rule. You never take more than one-third off the leaf at a time. The reason for that is that the plant is trying to get enough energy from the sun, and you're cutting it every time, and it's, an, it's little enough that it's not going to affect the root, root system too much. But what it actually does is it actually says, I need to find my energy elsewhere, therefore I need to shoot more leaves out. If I can't get it from one leaf, I'm going to get it from more leaves. So if you're wondering why your lawn isn't luscious and beautiful, you need to start mowing your lawn every two days. That's, that's actually serious. <sighs> serious. The more you mow your lawn, the better it will look. Okay? I want to mention this. If you were here last week, um, Alan Purvis had a go at me about fishing up here. I haven't fished in eight months, so what he said was irrelevant. But if he would have mentioned my lawn, whoa, I would have been convicted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> right? Good stress. And what he's saying is, hey, if you allow yourself to just grow and be lazy and, and come to church expecting, I'm just going to be fed, just feed me, you become fat. You become a fat Christian that becomes all about you. What do I get out of church? How do I get this out of church? But instead, what we're called to do is to actually shine our light and get pruned and cut so that we can grow. Like, it's uncomfortable sometimes to shine our light in the community or in our, in our friends group. Or it, it's really hard. It's really, like, embarrassing. But it's important that we put ourselves through that. When I think about this, there's a saying I read, I, I couldn't find who wrote it, uh, it definitely wasn't me. It's way too profound. Um, and he says this, most Christians don't stop believing. So think about a Christian who has just become stagnant. Stagnant, they're in sin. They've fallen away into sin. It says this, most Christians don't stop believing. They stop obeying. So if you're in that space, start obeying. You know what you've got to change. You know what you've got to do. It's hard. It's not fun. But it is part of the process of becoming all that God has created you to be. And then Jesus jumps to another part of the story, and it's kind of separated in the actual, in our Bibles. But I think it's relevant. I think this is another beautiful picture of discipleship. Jesus using a time, a moment to teach his disciples. And he says this, then Jesus, verse 19, then Jesus' mother and brother came to see him, but they couldn't get to him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brother are standing outside and they want to see you. Jesus replied, 
My mother and my brother are all those who hear God's word and obey it. That's a warning, right? It's a warning of looking at the fruit. It's a warning about looking at our lives and saying, okay, what does what I do, how I live, how does that show my relationship with God? Or am I just kind of kidding myself, saying, yeah, but I'm doing the right things? What I'm not talking about right now is saved by works. I'm not saying that you just have to do more and you'll be a, a better Christian, uh, you'll be a saved Christian. I'm not saying that you have to do more and more and more. I'm not saying that that's how salvation comes. What I'm saying is that when we receive Jesus into our heart, that our actions begin to show it. Martin Luther wrote this, We are saved by faith alone. But faith that saves, the faith that saves is never alone. The obvious thing to do when the light is lit within, when we have Jesus in our heart, is to shine it out. It's not works. It is the normal. It is the sensible. It is what we are called to do. I want you to think about our community. I want you to think about what it would look like if instead of going, and I use the example of a beach, right? Instead of going down to the beach and standing on the beach and seeing all these starfish littered on the beach, and you're like, how do I save them all? I may as well give up. I may as well just let them die. And I think we feel like that sometimes. I can say I do. I look at the community, I'm like, my goodness, they're so lost. Like, what can I do? But you imagine, if you're at the beach and I walked up to you and said, all I want from you is that one metre square. That's all I'm asking from you. And so you say, oh, I can do that. And you're there, you clean up your one metre square. Five minutes later, you look up. And all of a sudden, there's thousands of people along the beach that have looked after their one metre square, what they've been given, what they've been called to do, and all of a sudden, the beach is clean. So instead of saying to you, let's change our community, just think today, one person, two people that clearly God has put in your life, that, that you can just shine a light. Again, I'm not telling you that you have to be in there just evangelizing to a point that you're bashing them over the head with the Bible, but I'm saying, how are you using like Jesus? Like if, if we're going to learn from Jesus, he intentionally used a moment that his mum and, and brothers came to visit him to teach his disciples. And some of the best people that I've seen lead people to Christ are people that come around, a work colleague, and just use just small moments as teachable. Relationship. As I was, um, to finish, as I was writing this sermon and, and, and just going through it, the little phrase that just come to my head and I had to write it down, and I want to leave this with you today. And it's this, to shine Jesus' light is not an opportunity. Don't think of it as an opportunity. It's our responsibility. Let's stop thinking about opportunities and let's start looking at what responsibilities we've been given. Imagine standing before the throne. Imagine one by one hearing the words, good, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's my prayer. And if you're going, you're here on holidays and you're going home to your church, or if you're a part of our church, you and I know that that is the only way. We know that it's the obvious thing to do. Instead, we keep telling us about ourselves about illogical things like, oh, the pastors need to save people or, oh, if I just get them to church or, no, 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 don't palm off your responsibility. Don't do it. We have a God who has equipped each one of you 
If you think that you have nothing to give, can I just say that he has given you everything you need. Everything to do what pleases him, what he has asked for. Remember that to shine Jesus' light is not an opportunity we have, but it is our responsibility. And it is the outflowing of the gift of salvation we've been given. So let's, let's think about that this year. Let's think about the opportunities we've had, but also about what we are able to do. Let me pray for you today. Lord, we thank you that you, the creator, loved us so much that you would invite us into your plan of salvation, that you would give us the opportunity to be used for your glory that we have the opportunity to see you work in supernatural ways when we never thought possible. You step in and you do. And we thank you that you are good, that you are faithful to your word. And I pray right now, Spirit, that you would convict, that you would lead, and that you would just put in our minds those people that you are saying, go, go, just shine your light. Where you're saying, hey, you know how you're putting your light under the bed at home? Don't. Let's take that moment of acknowledging and take steps to become fitter and healthier in our spiritual walk so that we can be obedient and faithful to our calling. Thank you, Lord, that it's not up to us to save the world, but it is you working through us. And without you, we are working in vain. So we acknowledge, Father, that you are here, that you love us, and that you care. Thank you, Lord, in the almighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.